Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We are in a new chapter this morning, chapter 14. The Lord has finished His great Olivet Discourse, His lesson on the future and His coming. And now we read in chapter 14, Now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. While he was in Bethan at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard, And she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money, and he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in prayer. A book that had a big influence on people in the 1700s, men like the great evangelist George Whitfield and others, was Henry Scogel's The Life of God and the Soul of Man. In it is this statement, the worth and excellency of a soul is to be measured by the object of its love. The weight or greatness of a person's life can be known by what he or she loves. So what is the object of your love? What do you really value? Mark 14 presents two people with two different loves, which reveals everything about them. One loved money and the other loved Christ. One would have eternal glory, the other eternal shame. Our passage is about them, but it doesn't begin with either one. It begins with the priests and scribes plotting the murder of Jesus two days before the Passover. This begins the last portion of Mark's Gospel, where he recalls the Lord's trial, crucifixion, and concludes with his triumph in the resurrection. It's been called the final act of the drama. And the fact that it occurred at the Passover was providential. Passover was prophetic because it celebrated Israel's deliverance from slavery in Egypt when lambs were slain for every Jewish household. That was a picture of the Lamb of God who would come and take away the sin of the world and deliver God's people from the slavery of sin and death. And it all occurred according to God's eternal, sovereign plan. But for the plotters, it was an inconvenient time. During Passover, the population of Jerusalem grew from 25,000 to 50,000. Some have estimated it grew to over a million. Many of these people were enthusiastic about Jesus. 
Earlier in the week, they had escorted him into the city with messianic zeal, spreading their coats before him and shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. The priests and plotters were very much aware of this and feared the crowds. They were saying among themselves that they couldn't arrest Jesus during the feast for fear of a riot. They were determined to do that. They were determined to, to seize him and put him to death, but they were completely at a loss as to how they might pull that off. They thought they might have to wait until the festival was over and delay until the pilgrims had left. What they didn't know is someone was waiting in the wings to step forward and help them. Events had occurred four days earlier that had affected Judas and turned him against Jesus. That's where Mark goes in verse 3 in a flashback to show what had happened and why Judas joined the plot to kill the man that he had followed for three years. What he recounts and what Judas reacted against is one of the greatest acts of worship and spiritual insight in all of the Gospels and one of the greatest acts of sacrifice in the New Testament. It gives a window on the hearts of two people and revealed what they loved. And perhaps it will give each of us a moment of pause to reflect on what we love what we really care about. The Lord was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper for a dinner that was given out of love for him and gratitude, probably for the raising of Lazarus and the healing of Simon. Lazarus' sisters were there, Mary and Martha. According to John chapter 12, verse 2, Martha was serving while Jesus, the 12 disciples, and other guests were reclining around a table. At some point during the evening, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of costly perfume. Mark doesn't identify her, but we know from John's account that it was Mary. She broke the flask and poured the perfume on the Lord's head. John adds that she poured it on his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So she anointed the whole body of our Lord, head to foot, emptied the entire contents of the bottle, and filled the house with the fragrance of the perfume. It was an expensive act. Both Matthew and Mark emphasize the value of the perfume. They call it very costly. We're told here that it was valued at 300 denarii. John tells us that it was Judas who made that calculation, and so it's probably accurate because Judas knew money. He valued things and knew the value of things. 300 denarii was a lot of money. A denarius was a common worker's wage for a day of work. So it was almost one year's wages that she had poured out on Jesus. Now, this was not a rich woman. Mary lived in the small town of Bethany, lived a, a simple life, we would assume, and had probably sacrificed her life savings for this one act, this momentary act. But it wasn't an impulsive act. It was premeditated. It was probably planned out for some time and, and had a serious purpose. The Lord explained it. He knew what she had done, and he knew why she had done it. He says in verse 8 that she had anointed his body beforehand for his burial. And repeatedly, the Lord had told his disciples that he would die, that he would be put to death. We know at least three times prior to this, he tells them that. And in fact, in Matthew's account, this account this, the chapter that follows the, upper room, uh, the uh, Olivet Discourse begins with Jesus telling the disciples again that he would be handed over for crucifixion at the Passover. Now that occurs after this incident, but it's one more example of him being open with them and telling 
them what was about to happen to him. And what it indicates here is the plot of the priests was no mystery to him. Their secret was open to him. Now they were driven by hate, but driven nevertheless to fulfill God's plan of salvation for the world of his elect. But the disciples were as ignorant of this as the priests and scribes were, even though before, before this event, he had told them plainly what would happen, told them numerous times. One time, you remember back in chapter 8, he told them this, that he would be put to death and he would rise from the dead, and Peter rebuked him. And so the Lord, looking at his disciples, said, Get behind me, Satan. Now you would think after that exchange that it would register with them what he was speaking about, that he would be put to death, that he would suffer at the hands of the Jewish authorities and the Gentiles. But still, we come to this moment, they didn't get it. But Mary did. She was a perceptive person. She had listened to him over the years. She had seen him do miracles. She had witnessed him raise her brother from the dead. And so in response to what the Lord would soon do for her, go to the cross and offer himself up as a sacrifice for her, she made a sacrifice of her own for him. How did that happen? How did she, a person who wasn't with Jesus as often as the twelve were, how did she understand what they didn't? The answer to that is found in the place where she was often found, at the Lord's feet. According to John, that's where she was, anointing his feet with perfume, wiping them with her hair. That's where she was in Luke chapter 10. When Jesus came to Bethany for a visit, Martha was busy preparing the meal for everyone while Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. She not only sought knowledge from Jesus, she sought to know Jesus, to know him personally. She spent time with him. As a result, she knew him well. She understood who he was. God's Son, and what He had come to do, die for sinners, offer up His life, a sacrifice for them. So out of gratitude for His love for her and from a desire to honor His person and work, she gave all that she had for Him. Now that's true worship. It gives. It doesn't withhold. That's the pattern throughout the Bible. Mark, back in chapter 12, tells of the widow in the temple who gave her two mites. It was all she had, Luke tells us. The Lord commended her for it. It was an act of love. The Macedonians did that. Paul writes of them in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, how they were desperately poor but gave to Paul's mission to the Jews of Jerusalem and Judea, and they gave beyond their means. They did it out of love for the Lord, and they did it with joy. They, in fact, begged Paul to allow them to participate in his mission, even when he advised against it due to their extreme poverty. But they prevailed upon him. Worship is not measured in money. It's not measured in the size of the gift that we give. That's incidental. It is giving and doing relative to what we have and can do in time and means and effort. In Luke 7, there is a similar incident to the one here in Mark in which a sinful woman came into the house of Simon, not Simon the leper, but Simon the Pharisee. She wasn't welcomed in there. She hadn't been invited in there, but she came in spite of the hostile atmosphere toward her, and she wept over Jesus' dusty feet. 
And she knelt down and began to wash his feet with her tears, wipe them with her hair, and anoint them with perfume. She served him. She gave what she had. She gave her tears. They were as valuable to the Lord as Mary's perfume because they reflected her love for him, for his grace, for her. She loved much, Jesus explained, because she was forgiven much. Now that's what worship is. It's an expression of love. The key is not the gift, but the motive. The gift is merely a reflection of the heart and an expression of one's love. And love gives. That's what the Lord saw here in Mary. So when it happened and the disciples were critical, calling her act a waste, saying that she should have sold the perfume and given the money to the poor, he rebuked them. He called her act a good deed. Literally, that is a beautiful work. Now, this is characteristic of the Lord. This tells us a lot about him. He came to her rescue. She had done a good thing. The disciples were criticizing her for it, ganging up and humiliating her, and he would not allow it. He was a real leader. He was a true friend. He always defended his followers. He defended his disciples when the Pharisees came and attacked them. He stood between them and the Pharisees and he defended them. He didn't leave his friends to their critics. He defended them against the majority. He was the final fulfillment of the law. The law of Moses commanded the people to care for widows and orphans and aliens, to care for the weakest members of society, and Jesus did that fully. That's his character. He's the defender. And here he defended Mary against what, on the face of it, seemed to be a legitimate complaint. She'd wasted good money. Think of all the poor people we could have clothed and fed with that money. No, the Lord said, what she did was good. It was beautiful because it was done for him. He stopped her critics with that. Then he explained, for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Lord, of course, wasn't being insensitive to the poor. He cared greatly for the poor. He sympathized with them in part because he was one of them. The foxes have their holes, the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He told the rich young ruler to sell his possessions and give them to the poor. Paul went on a special mission to relieve the poor saints in Jerusalem during a time of famine. The Lord was not indifferent. He knew poverty. He knew how crushing it could be. But the poor aren't going away. They would always be here. There will always be opportunities to do good for them. There would not always be opportunities to do good for him. In his humiliation, in his incarnation, his humanity, he was going away soon in his death, as he had so often told them. Mary understood that and seized the opportunity to do something good something beautiful for him while she could and to do all that she could. But still, it was not just a matter of opportunity. It was a matter of priority. The spiritual is more important than the material. It's more important to minister to Christ than to the poor. That's not an either-or proposition. We, we do both. A concern for the needs of others is an expression of our spiritual life. But the most important concern is spiritual. The most important object is Christ. 
Put another way, the most important need is not relieving material po poverty, but relieving spiritual poverty and glorifying God. That's our first priority, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And Jesus was making the claim here to be God. Who else but God could claim to be worthy of such an extravagant gift and, and, and an act of worship? What's most important in life is that we know Him and love Him and serve Him. That's what we were made to do. And to the degree that we love Him, we will love others and live well. So the Lord makes two points here. First, worship. Knowing God, honoring and serving Him out of love is the most important thing that we can do. And second, He is God. He's the Son of God. Mary worshipped Him in her deed. It was intelligent worship. It wasn't impulsive. Jesus indicates that here. He said, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. I, I, I don't doubt that there was emotion in her act as there was emotion in the act of that sinful woman in Luke chapter 7. But what caused the emotion and what caused the act was the knowledge she had. Her act was well informed. True worship is well informed. She knew he was le leaving. She knew that he would die. That is what he told his disciples so frequently. He would be crucified. So she gave everything she had to him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, Paul said that though Christ was rich, yet for our sake he became poor. So that through his poverty, we might become rich, rich beyond anything we know. Mary understood that. How much she understood, I don't know. But she understood that he had become poor for her and would die for her, and so she gladly made herself poor for him without regrets. The more we know God and what He has done for us in Christ, the more intelligent and irrepressible our worship will be. The more we understand Him, the more genuine and pure our love will be. Jesus said, she has done what she could. I think those words are a real blessing. She has done what she could. The Lord has gifted all of us, some more than others. He has given all of us possessions and He's given all of us gifts and abilities, some more than others. And He expects us to use what He's given us, to use our gifts, to use our possessions for Him and to, to honor and glorify Him. But He doesn't expect us to do more than we can, only what we can. She has done what she could, he said. She used what God had given her, and what she used and what she did was great. It was a sacrifice that most wouldn't make. From what took place at that meal, it was a sacrifice that none of the disciples would have made. And Jesus said in verse 9 that she would forever be remembered for it. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Paul stated clearly in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, and 1 Timothy 2, verse 11, that a woman is not to teach in the congregation as a whole, not to teach a man or exercise authority in that way. It doesn't say a woman isn't to teach. There's a proper place for all of that. 
But the man is to exercise authority according to the apostle. The fact is, oftentimes, true actions speak louder than words. And Mary's example did. It was more eloquent than any statement she could have made. She showed that she had more understanding than the men there in the room. And maybe even loved the Lord more than the disciples did. And the Lord's statement has proved true. Her deed has been told around the world. Wherever the gospel has been preached, Matthew, Mark, and John have helped in that. In fact, they told the story. That's how we know it. And that indicates something about them. It indicates that they received the Lord's correction. They learned from it and repented. Not all the disciples did. Judas didn't. It's clear from John's account in John chapter 12 that Judas was the one behind the indignant response to Mary's good deed He stirred up the anger in the other disciples and he's the one that said that the money should have been, that the perfume should have been sold and the money should have been given to the poor. John tells us that it was all a sham. Judas didn't really care about the poor. He coveted the money. If the perfume had been sold, he could have stolen the cash. Judas was a thief. John said. He was the treasurer. He was a trusted disciple. They they entrusted what they had to him. He kept the money box. We're also told he used to steal out of it. What Jesus called a good thing was a waste to him. This was a decisive moment for Judas. He was probably offended by the rebuke. No doubt he was. But he also had enough insight to realize where things were headed. Not to a throne, but to a cross. Like Mary, he too understood what the Lord had said. But unlike Mary, he didn't get the importance of it. And he didn't love the Lord. So he switched loyalties and cut a deal with the priests. They were happy. They saw in this a solution to their problem. They could seize Jesus stealthily, without delay, and without worry of the crowds. But Judas had a price. Matthew tells us that he asked how much they would pay him for his act of betrayal, and they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. Now, according to the law, 30 pieces of silver was the amount to be paid in compensation for a slave who was gored by an ox. That was the value that Judas placed on the Son of God, the value of a slave. Not much. Mary, on the other hand, couldn't put a value on him. She took nothing. She gave everything she had for him. But then they had two very different loves. Judas loved money, which really means he loved self. That's really what is at the root of the love of money and the love of the world. And he made a bad bargain. I don't know what he thought he'd do with the money. It really wasn't very much. In the end, he did nothing with it. He he lost it all and lost his life in remorse for what he'd done. But even if it had been a fortune, even if he'd gained the whole world, it was a bad bargain because he lost his soul. And all who sell the Lord for the world sell him cheaply and sell themselves short. Mary, on the other hand, loved the Lord not the world, not herself. She valued what is true and eternal. So she worshipped him and served him with all she had and had no regrets. Well, maybe one. Her only regret, if she had one, was that she didn't have more to spend on Christ. 
what she did was far too small for the Son of God who loved her and gave himself up for her. Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield was like that. He was a brilliant young man with academic interests in math and physics. He graduated with honors and prizes. He had a promising career ahead of him in science and was studying in Heidelberg, Germany when he surprised his parents with a letter announcing that he planned to leave that to study for the ministry. He entered Princeton Seminary where he later taught as one of the most distinguished professors in the school's history and one of the most influential theologians of the early 20th century. Years later, a close friend of his recounted a conversation they had their first semester in seminary. One September evening, they were sitting before a window in their dorm, uh, looking out over the campus. They were recalling travels that they had taken together through Europe, the great cities they'd visited, their hikes in the Alps. When he asked Warfield why he decided to enter the ministry, it meant giving up an impressive career in the academy and science. His friend wrote about the conversation they had and said, I can hear the very sound of his voice. He turned to me and said, because I think that in the work of the ministry, I can do the most to repay the Lord for what he has done for me. That's love for Christ. And giving up everything to serve him in the ministry or in simple daily obedience is love like Mary had. You don't have to leave your work or leave your studies to enter seminary and become a great theologian to truly worship the Lord. Mary was not that. She's more of a theologian than those disciples were. She understood, and that led to great worship. But the act of worship and what is praised here is she gave what she had. She did what she could for him. We began our study with the statement, the worth and excellency of a soul is to be measured by the object of its love. That invites the question, what is the object of your love? There are really just two loves. Love like Mary and love like Judas. Love of Christ and love of self. Augustine divided the world in that way. The Bible does that. It divides the world between two people, those of faith and those of unbelief, sons of the new birth and those of only natural birth. Augustine spoke of two loves, the love of God and the love of self, which have given birth, he said, to two cities, the city of God and the city of man. We are all citizens of one of those cities. The city of God is eternal. It is in heaven, and it will someday be on earth. The city of man is now. It's here. It is attractive, but it's temporal. It is fading, and it will burn up. It's a bad bargain. What do you love? The world? Yourself? That's all doomed. Such love destroyed Judas. It will destroy you. Look to Christ. Trust in Him. He's our Passover who gave His life to free us from our sins, from their power and penalty. And you who have believed, live for Him. Isaac Watts put it well in his hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, with the words, Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. So it does. Let's stand together and sing that hymn in the Red Book. 
I can't remember the, the number of it, but Warren will read it to us. When I survey the wondrous cross. Father, we do confess were the whole realm of nature ours, it's a present far too small for what you've done for us. We do thank you for that. Thank you for the, get, the death of your son, the blood that has redeemed us. Thank you for him. Fill us with knowledge. Fill us with devotion. May we worship him as we ought. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.